I'm going to be really brief introducing because um, I think you all have read the emails that I've sent out. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to say this as as a personal story, um, my introduction, and then I'm going to let uh, Raja and Jeffrey, the authors of The Wall Between, what Jews and Palestinians don't want to know about each other, uh, take it from there. But uh, we've certainly never had a time of where it's harder to talk to each other and so much easier to scream at each other, as we're seeing right now. And so the story I want to tell that immediately when I started reading uh, their book long before this this horrific, horrific war broke out, uh, what, what it brought back for me, what it reminded me of was um, the first time I was I, I went to Israel, Palestine, was a peace delegation to see the situation with my own eyes. And I stayed a couple days after, and I was invited uh, by a friend who was interviewing uh, a Palestinian family that was living on the side of the road in East Jerusalem in a cave. Um, and they were living in the cave, which was like exhaust fumes coming into this, just a cave, because the Israeli military had bulldozed their home, had removed their home. And the way that Israeli military law, the way it works over there, is that uh, they they can say that if you're not living on that parcel of land, then it can be taken by the government. And so they were living in this cave on the part of their land, on the side of the road, uh, in order to hold on to their property in East Jerusalem. And so uh, a few of us went there and, you know, I was invited along to witness this interview. And um, I've always worn a Star of David. It's my faith and it's holy and sacred to me. Um, but this this gentleman, this man, looked at me and he, that, he looked right at it and he just his eyes, just fear, just fear uh, in his eyes. And he said, she can't be here. She can't be here. She can't be here. And there was, he was speaking in Arabic and it went back and forth for a bit. And uh, he was uh, helped to understand that um, I was a Jew in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle. But what I realized was this symbol so sacred to me to him represented the most horrendous forms of oppression. And if we're not able to hear each other speak, then how are we able to um, achieve reconciliation and, and struggle together for a more just and equitable and peaceful world? So with that, I wanna give you uh, Raja and Jeffrey. So please take it away. Oh, I thought you were going to ask us something. All right. <laughs> oh no, I was going to let you get started. Okay, let me let me let me ask you something. And I'm going to not begin by going into the the current war because I know there's so much to say about that. But I really want to talk about this book. So, if you could start off with um, what inspired you to write the book, and if you have some passages, I would love if you would read them. Sure, sure thing. I'll, I'll start us off, Jeff. If that's okay. Um, so it, it, back in 2007, I, I was part of a, uh, a sort of hate crimes community working group put together by the province of Ontario. Uh, you know, a bunch of people from different communities, as it happened, as I was sitting in that room, uh, to the person to my left and the other person to my right were both Jewish, representing uh, in a sort of Jewish organizations. And, uh, you know, it, it, we had kind of sparred in the past politically about issues of Israel Palestine, uh, you know, me as the head of a Canadian Arab Federation here. Uh, by the end of the work of that committee, the working group that was part of, you know, all the talk was about how to, you know, prevent hate and promote human rights. And, um, you know, we, I, I, I saw that we had a lot of common ground on issues relating to, uh, you know, human rights uh, and civil rights. And I thought, you know, maybe there's more to, to than meets the eye here in terms of what else can we have common ground about? So I suggested we start talking, and we did. And that, uh, you know, that went on for 16 years. 
And I learned a lot during that process, such as from them, uh, it was the first time I heard someone say that Zionism to them uh, is a movement for uh, self-determination uh, for Jews. Uh, I'd never heard that before because I'd never spoken to Jews before. And uh, to me, you know, Zionism was the force that destroyed Palestinian society and caused my parents to become refugees in another country. So, um, and and you know, they they learned from me that what everything Zionism gave to them, uh, it took away from me, took away from Palestinians, everything it took, it gave to Jews. And I wanted, you know, part of the reason I wanted to write this book is to share the, all the things that I've learned about Jews in, in my years of uh, dialogue that other Palestinians, uh, you know, would not have the opportunity to learn. Um, and, and the other reason was that I thought, you know, our communities here in the diaspora and in, in Canada and the United States uh, should be doing much better than they were doing in terms of their relations with each other. Uh, the relations between them were uh, of animosity, distrust, fear, hate, even. Um, so instead of replicating and importing the, uh, the, the, the troubles from over there and magnifying them here, uh, I figured at least some of us ought to be able to do better as citizens of the same country here who do not live under the gun, who do not live in, in conditions of uh, physical violence. And um, and and that's, you know, that's the other reason I wanted to have this kind of book out there so that it can become a, a spark to for conversations, to to enable us to at least have something to talk about, uh, to take from there. And then, of course, October 7 happened, and we'll talk about that uh, later. Go over to you, Jeff. You, you're, you need to unmute. Good, wouldn't it? Yeah. Um, thank you, folks, uh, for having uh, Raj and I today, and for Ariel and FOR for hosting us. Um, so my journey, you know, like all of ours, is kind of a circuitous, uh, sneaky route. But uh, the short version is that my mother um, was born in Munich, Germany, um, uh, to a German Jewish family. And with all of that entails, um, uh, they were able to leave um, my mother and her brother and her parents were able to leave in 1936. My parent, my grandparents spent uh, most of the war in hiding and survived. And all of their relatives, uh, sisters, brothers, et cetera, all died in the Holocaust. Um, um, I'm a teacher and musician by training. And uh, throughout my teaching life, I became very, very interested in human rights work in general. And when I came to academia somewhat later in life, um, I became really curious about human rights stories that I didn't know about and why I didn't know about them. And particularly as a Jew, um, I had a very clear, deep understanding, I felt, of my experience as a Jew, of what my family and others had experienced um, of anti-Semitism. I had a great freedom to tell and share my story to very receptive audiences. And I discovered the Palestinian colleagues who, who didn't share that same freedom. And I really wanted to know why that was. And uh, through that process, uh, my doctoral dissertation was uh, was having Jews and Palestinians listen to each other and respond to each other's trauma uh, stories. And Raja was one of um, uh, my participants uh, uh, from uh, Palestine. Um, uh, he he usually says I'm um, that I was or he still is uh, one of my victims, um, and. Our goal, my goal primarily in writing this book is real horror at how we have imported the violence over there, over here. Um, and none of that has been more true than since October 7th. Our book has turned out to be deeply prophetic and we wish that it hadn't. 
um, we have seen levels of polarization that neither of us have ever witnessed. And we wrote a book on polarization. So um, it is really quite stunning to watch our communities uh, yell at each other, hurl insults, see almost incapable of seeing past their own pain and their own story to see deep violence responded to by more violence. Um, you know, and our commitment is to bring a, a some sense of repair, not add more trauma. In, in other words, you know, we're disappointed to see our communities behave exactly the way we say we they do behave in our book. I mean, and they did they went ahead and did it again. Could you, know. you for anybody that isn't that doesn't eat, sleep, and <laughs> breathe uh, the Holy Land Middle East stuff like the three of us? Um, give a little overview not not of what's happening over uh in israel palestine right now but what the climate looks like in terms of the vitriol and the divisions um here in the west um yeah i mean we we have people losing their jobs being being uh, suspended um politicians community leaders taking absolutist uh positions um you know when you know the, the the premier of ontario the governor of ontario says you're you know pro-palestinian rallies are evil and uh they, they are supporting terrorists and that he and his uh, caucus will always stand with Israel. You know, he, he's forgetting that a large proportion of the citizens of Ontario, uh, you know, are don't think so. You know, they they are supporters of Palestinian rights, um, and you know that's very marginalizing to see that you know it's such a high level politicians making a statement that excludes you so outrightly uh, as such. Uh, we've seen, uh, you know, pro-Israel organizations repeat the same kind of nonsense about these rallies are, are anti-Semitic, uh, that the attacks of October 7 were, uh, you know, anti-Semitic and going out to kill Jews because they hate Jews. I mean, these were political events. Uh, you, know, you don't have to endorse Hamas or what Hamas did to see that this was a brutal attack, for, for sure. But that's not the start of this conflict. This is happening on the 76th year of the conflict. And... Uh, it, it, the the you know I was at a at a peace rally a couple of days ago on Sunday in downtown Toronto and it was about two hundred people two thirds of them Jews and there were others Muslims Arabs Palestinians and other people and, and the main message of that rally was that humanity is is for all you know it, it's it's not well these people are a little bit less of human beings unless you're a racist you don't say stuff like that so. You know, when, when our leaders uh, behave in a way that says, well, the humanity of these people here is more important than the humanity of these other people there, and they say that with a straight face, and, and while, you know, people are dying in the hundreds, civilians are dying in the hundreds every day, say, we, we trust Israel to follow international humanitarian law uh, when it clearly isn't. You know, the, the, these kind of extreme reactions do not help anyone. They might help someone's political career. They might advance the interests of certain organizations, but they don't have help us have a cohesive society that truly, you know, has common values and applies them consistently and not selectively. 
Um, yes, and I'll add, you know, and we'll we'll reflect yes. some of how our. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Please. Oh no no no! I was saying please. <laughs> okay. Um, so our book. I mean, we will get into our um, very soon how our book sort of deals with these polarizations and deals with how really what you've seen on the ground if you're watching um, uh, social media and newscasts is that it's about the perceptions of reactions. So Jews, certainly most uh, members of my tribe um, were deeply, deeply troubled by the events of October 7th and have reacted not only out of that trauma, which is a trauma in and of itself, but very much out of residual trauma from the Holocaust and 2000 years of marginalization, and even out of future trauma that hasn't happened yet. The fear that this is a signatory of what is to come. And uh, for most Palestinians and their supporters, the, the claims everywhere about anti-Semitism, some of them absolutely need, you know, are true and need to be you know, called out uh, completely. Not all. Uh, some are exaggerated. Some are said for political purposes. Uh, some are unnuanced. And this has created uh, this environment where for Palestinians, they feel that anti-Semitism is being used as a club to silence them. And we'll read a little bit in a minute about how we talk about that in our book. I think it's uh, most important for people in this audience, if I read the audience correctly, that are mostly observers that aren't members of the two tribes that we talk about, but are observers and you know, caring um, interlocutors who want to help and support. I'm gonna say two things. One is we are not evaluating the pain or the level of trauma. There is no trauma meter that we're using to diagnose trauma. There is deep pain that has been there and will continue to be there on both sides. The pain is different, comes from different places, but pain is pain. Misery has no hierarchy. Misery is misery, death is death. So that's the starting point is there is no hierarchy to the trauma. We don't, we aren't more concerned about Jewish trauma than we are by Pal about Palestinian uh, trauma. We're not less concerned about Palestinian trauma than we are Jewish trauma. Then once you place that deep concern and that human value oh. first, oh. you then have an opportunity to say, all right, how do we apply moral and ethical principles of human rights and dignity for all to the questions that we're dealing with? So we're not arguing over who has more right or who should be in more pain. We're focused instead on what is a righteous, just solution moving forward. Yeah. Um... You know, I've been watching here in, in the U.S., and, and you were saying it's similar in Canada, just the Jewish community ourselves are so much at e each other's neck. And I've been, you know, really pondering this this way that we've positioned ourselves as Jews um, in opposition to each other. So you're either uh, for the war, for the uh, for Israel's, you know, bombings, or you're for Hamas. And it's just not, that's not the place. And, you know, when when I say I'm calling for a ceasefire, I realize that my own tribe, my people hear that as I don't care about the hostages. And yet the hostages' lives are endangered by the, the bombs that are falling. And I follow the families of the hostages and the faces of the mothers. And I can't imagine my child, a young child, my mother being held hostage for seven weeks. I, I can't fathom it. But, but that's the immediate assumption. If I say ceasefire, it means I love Hamas and hate the Jews. Or I, I say ceasefire, and that means, oh, no care for the hostages. And 
so if you if you guys could um read from a passage uh it could be about how we we talk over each other that way and make those assumptions or it could be um another part and and i want to appreciate uh the talk about trauma and i want to get back to that Perhaps, uh, Jeff, we can uh, uh, read from Palestinian Resistance. Think of the same thing. Yeah, I think it starts on page uh, 68. 68. 68. Um, Got it. I'm going to start. I'll start us off. I'm, okay. Uh, Maybe you should you... say a word about what Palestinian Resistance is for our audience first. Well, well, why don't you do that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So when we say Palestinian resistance, that term alone is a trigger term. And okay? so for many Jews and, and others in the West for a variety of reasons, resistance rings like terrorism. So it is, it is placed not in a righteous way but in a way that is violent against our exceptional way of life. And we're going to read a little bit about that. And we're also going to talk about how resistance to an occupied, oppressed people is life, is breath, is the same <laughs> being. One of the things uh, I learned from Jeff uh, is that how the West and Jews perceive Palestinian resistance. Uh, you know, to me, it, it was a normal thing to do to resist oppression, to resist occupation, to you know, resist any violence against you. Um, and it was uh, you know an awakening uh, for me to learn about how how it's uh, perceived by uh, Jews and in the West. Uh, so, reading from the book. To Jews, Palestinian resistance means terrorism and the destruction of Israel. It means Islamist fanatics willing to blow themselves up to kill Jews and then destroy Israel. It means Hamas hurling rockets at Sderot to kill innocent Jews and destroy Israel. It means boycotts that aim to discredit Israel in order to destroy it. It means accusations of apartheid aimed at smearing Israel in order to destroy it. It means Islamic countries ganging up to demonize Israel in international forums in order to destroy it. To Palestinians, resistance is a philosophical and existential condition. As long as they resist, their will cannot be broken. As long as they will resist, they will continue to exist. As long as they resist, they remain the bane of the Zionist project. They resist by any means over there in Israel-Palestine through defiance, martyrdom, and jihad, and over here in the North American diaspora through advocacy, art, film, poetry, music, theater, and boycotts. See, the, uh, and we, Jeff and I were talking the other day in the middle of everything that's happening. And I said to him, Palestinians do not even refer to Hamas as Hamas. They, they call it the resistance. Um, the, it, it, not because they, you know, support violent actions of Hamas as much as it is holding on to something that is, you know, defending them or at least, you know, striking back at the people who are hurting them. Because no one else is. Uh, uh, you know, I, I, I do not, I, I'm not a fan of Hamas. I do not condone their methods. Um, and you know, after after October seven, we there were a lot of demands for people to, do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas? Do you condemn Hamas? Well, I condemn what they did on the seventh. Uh, you know, it, it was a war crime. Um, 
But two reasons I do not condemn it outright is, A, to Palestinians, it's still their resistance. And B, uh, and as important, is that none of us here on this call know what they would do if they were living in Gaza under the conditions that people have been living in for 16 years. Um, yes, absolutely. I, um, excuse me, I wonder if I'm, I'm seeing a lot of chat. Of course, it's a large group, so there's a lot of conversation. So I'm going to be the trauma guy for a minute. Not only Jews and Palestinians are hurting. Those who are observing are hurting. Those people of faith are hurting. What is happening is, you know, in contravention to how the human spirit would like to function. And we're looking for answers. And when we look for answers, this uh, lovely thing up here we call the brain usually goes into retreat method. It sinks to the familiar. It sinks to what we think we know, and it resists asking what I don't know. What we actually know about knowledge is most of what there is to know is in our don't know, we don't know zone. Um, uh, there's a little saying we use in social psychology called a witsiati. It means what you see is all there is. So I'm going to encourage all of us as we have, you know, a half an hour left together. And of course, there'll be time for questions, right, Ariel? Um, try to sit in vulnerability, in openness, in reflection. As humans, we have an inflated view of our own opinion and even an inflated view of the importance of opinion. True growth and learning happens when we let go of opinion and just allow something new to filter into our psyche and into our bodies. I'm just going to offer that, that we all really do that. Take a breath, do whatever we need to do, and just can we in the next half hour, what can we come up with? What can we think of together that is focused on shared experience? that is focused on reducing trauma, that is focused on showing love and compassion for those that are suffering, not choosing sides. So you know, we, we often say that, uh, you know, you learn from people who you disagree with, right? I mean, the, uh, and you know, our, our book is really is a lot about learning. Uh, it's about learning about the other, you know, why they react the way they do, why they think the way they do. But it's also learning about our own communities and why we behave the way we do and react the way we do. And, uh, you know, we explain the role of trauma in that. Uh, and that's a big part of how, why we react, the emotion that comes in our, our actions comes from trauma. The other reason we explain is that there are a lot of people out there who are happy with this status quo, who, who would like to keep things the way they are. Their, you know, their job is to polarize, their job is to demonize. We call them bad actors, B-A-D-D. -D. What they do is blame, attack, uh, demonize and dismiss the other, and they create hatred. They do that very well, and letting them do that to us, what they do is they manipulate our wounds and make us, you know, afraid and you know and and uh, distrustful of the other and in fear of them and uh, and not even see them as as human, um, and and that's destructive clearly and you know we give the reader a choice in the last uh, a few chapters you know do you want to continue to be motivated by trauma and by uh, you know disinformation propaganda coming from certain groups or do you want to driven be driven by values that we say we believe in like freedom human rights justice 
uh, common humanity. Um, and, and we're hoping that at least some people will, you know, respond favorably to this message and start looking at this situation differently. So the left as a whole um, is, is not very fond of talking to each other frequently unfond of that. And in the Palestine solidarity movement, um, there's a lot of rejection of what's called normalization. So uh, speaking, you know, getting together to talk, but not take political action. And your book, um, while you seek to learn from each other, doesn't... Um, also recognizes facts on the ground, like historical injustices and those basic facts. And can you talk a bit ha about how you you see this as, um, first of all, about that? Because we could have debates, right, about, um, and, and plenty bad actors will start those debates uh, about Palestine never existed or something like that. Um, but A, how you, you start from a basis of fact and how that moves into mutually agreed upon principles of justice and freedom, and then how you see uh, talking to each other as um, key to working together for mutual liberation. And I'll, I'll just say, you know, um, we in Jewish community are very clear that our liberation is is bound up in the liberation of Palestinians. You want to take the first part? I'll take the second part. Okay. <laughs> um, sure. So the first part for me is is that we respond by listening and asking questions. So you 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 kind of hit it here a little bit at. Uh, some of the contested ground, you know, in this debate. So, for ex example, words like apartheid or settler colonialism. The key is to ask and try to understand the essence of what someone is getting at. So, if, for instance, a Palestinian or a Palestinian supporter says, you know, Israel is nothing more than a settler colonial project. That is an unnuanced statement that misses the complexities of what Zionism is. Zionism is a liberation project in part. Zionism is a project of nationalism, is a Jewish national project. And it was created by primarily European men whose only model for an expansionist idea was colonialism. And they they themselves speak the word colonialism and ask advice from colonialists because that was the perspective that they knew. Secondly, the effects of Zionism on Palestinians is very similar to settler colonial impacts. Loss of land, loss of control, loss of autonomy, loss of political power, loss of identity. rights. And identity. And, and a loss of identity. Yet if you're going to say to someone you want to dialogue with, who, who has a stake in maintaining safety for Jews in the land between the river and the sea, and I'll want to talk about that for a minute. Um, you need to be able to understand that Zionism is not just or a typical settler colonial project. It is much more than that. And when you say to a Jew, it's nothing more than settler colonialism, they will most likely experience that as a denial of their right to exist. And unless you understand those nuances, you're not going to be able to have a conversation. And the last thing I'll say before Rodna takes over is a very controversial terms that's come up a lot since October 7th is the protest chant, 
Palestine will be free from the river to the sea. I want to say two things about it. One is it has been misstated as a call for the elimination of Jews in the land and for by some the elimination of Jews worldwide. To the vast, vast, vast majority of Palestinians, it is a call for equal rights between the river and the sea. Secondly, since the founding of the state of Israel, the declaration charter of the state of Israel says a land for Jews between the river and the sea. So as we become aware of these nuances, we can listen to each other. We can learn from each other. We can become less defensive. And we can say, oh, I hear what you're saying about that. Okay. My partner? Yeah. A, um, interesting. I mean, a, a friend of mine, a friend of ours, I should say, who is a, describes himself as a um, progressive Zionist, wrote a piece uh, in the paper the other day, uh, in one of the main papers in Canada, uh, about working together, common values. I mean, the piece was perfect for common understanding and working together and, you know, respect for everyone and all rights and all of those things. But I know when that person, I've, I've had discussions, many discussions with that person, that when we get into discussions, those intellectual ideas and principles that he genuinely believes in is unable to actually act on them and is held back by the emotion. The, you know, the the minute your discussion goes to into a place where it's threatening, the principles go out the window. So, you know, agreeing on common ground and principles certainly is essential for any dialogue process, for any attempt to bring groups together to work together to do something constructive uh, together. Uh, but there has to also be this willingness to listen, to understand, and not listen to respond. And when people feel threatened, they start listening to respond, and they may not even be aware of it. Um, so, you know, you have to have the common ground, build trust, spend a lot of time building trust, get to that point where you believe that the other is saying what they're saying, because they actually believe it and not to score a point with you. I mean, you have to go past the stage of scoring points. And if that person actually believes what they say, you want to understand why rather than push back and tell them that they're wrong. Um, and you know, and 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 in the end, I mean, my dream, uh, my my re dream is that there will be a large group of. Jews and Palestinians working together here in North America to try and bring peace to the lands over there, rather than the exact opposite that we're doing right now is bringing the war from over there and and you know and and using it to separate us from each other here. I'm going to start a little bit of moving to some questions. Um, and uh, can you talk about how the visceral reaction to October seventh um, from all sides? There was a there was a visceral reaction among Jews, Arabs, Christians, and so on. There is, I would say, a deeper investment in in this um conflict than we maybe have seen ever um and if you could talk about you know what's behind that um and how we and then i also want to add in because i see a question taking place in the chat about uh disproportionality and you know kind of that uh that question if we're listening to each other's trauma um does that mean we're not paying attention to the disproportionate um, 
power the power imbalance and even the disproportionality of this of the death toll um i'm going to start with the second half because i i don't i don't want to miss it um so as we talked a little bit about before acknowledging appreciating the other's trauma is 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 not a power conversation it is a conversation a human conversation between two people trying to understand, make a spiritual connection with each other. You cannot talk grand scheme about Israel-Palestine without talking about power. So the trauma is the entry point. I have pain, you have pain. We can have empathy for each other's pain. We can understand that our pain in part is driving our opinion and that that's really important. But our entire framework you know, is based on the inequities of power that I have had to work and learn as a Jew that my community, if, if I had to name one traumatic schism in our being, in our collective Jewish life that we are dealing with, is how to hold being both victim and victimizer together. And in some cases, to even shift our dialectic from 2,000 years of victimhood to being oppressors. I think that is such, psychologically, such a shock to the system that it is very, very difficult to do. Jews, to talk, for instance, about Jews and power, when most of our entire... 2,000, you know, 3,000 years of history has been the loss of power and the lack of ability to create our own uh, way to protect ourselves. Um, a, a Jewish friend of both Raja and I, you know, will often say, whenever we've left it up to somebody else to look after us, it has not gone well. So this is, this is complete loss of power. This is a feeling of having no agency to create your own safety. And Israel really is Jewish agency for its own safety. So this complexity is just so central to the issue. We call um, Jewish um, uh, pro-Israel lobby groups uh, sometimes um, on elegant muscularity of versus marginalized resistance so this power dynamic plays out everywhere one group kind of can often use its political might to appear more righteous and the other group is then framed as violent uh non-productive non-helpful and this of course just keeps the mess uh, going and Maybe Raja can answer, but why don't you? Can you remind us of the first half of the question? Yes, the first half of the question was if you could talk about the visceral reaction that wide swaths of the world, Jews, Palestinians, Christians, um, Muslims, uh, had to October 7th. And uh, it's just the, the, historical nature of that oh okay i, I thought we agreed you get the tough questions <laughs> <laughs> Your turn. all right look i mean I, i've been actually thinking about what is it about this particular conflict that it polarizes communities all over the world uh I mean, we, we've had members of parliament here removed from caucus because of something they said uh, uh, about this conflict uh, in Canada. I mean, we've had people lose their jobs. Um, in Europe, in, in Asia, I mean, there are demonstrations happening all over the world. And, you know, one thing I, I came to the conclusion of, and, and that's just me speculating here, 
is that it's a conflict between two rights and it's a conflict between two wrongs. One right is that, you know, the Jews after the Holocaust, after centuries of anti-Semitism, anti -Semitism, needed a home. The other right is that Palestinians to this day need a home and have been oppressed for 75 years. The wrong, of course, was what happened to Jews before the war and what happened to Palestinians in the Nakba. How many Americans or Canadians do you think know the word Nakba, the catastrophe of 1948? Uh, 16? I'm exaggerating, but very few, very, very few. Whereas, the, you know, the Holocaust is something we are very well familiar with, have been well documented, and people study about it in schools. Uh, there's been many books and movies and plays and you name it. Uh, that You can't say the same about the Nakba. So we understand, on the one hand, uh, you know, Jewish history and the oppression of Jews and feel for that, and rightly so. But on the other hand, we, do, we don't get the, as, as Westerners, as people here in, in, in North America, we, we don't know the Nakba, we don't know the history, we don't know how to hang that thing that Palestinians uh, sort of uh, are so influenced by. Um, so, you know, <laughs> the, 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 these two wrongs and two rights makes this a very, uh, uh, difficult conflict to deal with and for people to be able to be non-binary about it. He, he absolutely. Uh, the great uh, Palestinian thinker, Edward Said said, you know, of Palestinians, that we are victims of the victims and refugees of the refugees. Um, I also want to clear up something I think I'm interpreting from the chat. So just to be clear, um, I personally and Raja and I have no issue with the term settler colonialism. Um, we, you know, my frame is that certainly the impact on Palestinians, if not the intent, is a settler colonial frame. I have no issue with it or no problem with it. But my work is to bring, to, in, to widen the tent, to bring people in. So I know that these terms, to many of my Jewish colleagues, are resistor terms, are, you know, are fright terms. They, they run from them. So first of all, I'm trying to be very clear about how I'm defining them. And secondly, I use terms only as they are absolutely essential to the conversation. What is essential to me about Zionism is that what it gave to me, it took from Raja. That is the central nub of Zionism. My group won by causing his to lose. That's what Zionism is for me from a justice perspective. I know that it is way more than that to the vast majority of Jews. And I'm sympathetic and empathetic that they feel that. My particular view of Judaism has made it so my gain at someone else's loss is unacceptable to me. I just wanted to make sure I was clear about that. Raja, if you thought that last question was hard, <laughs> Wait for the one I have now, which is if you and you get it, if, <laughs> you both get it. Okay, feel hopeful about a peaceful resolution to this conflict. Told you it was a hard question <laughs> at some point. And what do you think that the the stakes are? Um, right now in this in this current moment where uh we may get a temporary ceasefire in exchange for uh 
Israeli hostages to be released and Palestinian prisoners to be released. And at the same time, um, we are seeing so much hatred rise, um, hate crimes, real anti-Semitism across the world. Are you hopeful (laughs) for a resolution at some point? And if so, please give me your hope. I would like to start by quoting my my friend Jeff here, my friend and colleague here, who says, "We have what, what's the phrasing, Jeff? What's the proper phrasing? You say we don't we we have no option. Hope, hope is not an option. That's right. Thank you. And and what I say to hopelessness is not an option. Right. I'm sorry." I, I'm said it wrong too. It's uh, I don't. We quoted. We were quoted in a newspaper article. Article say that um, hope is our duty. Hope is what we must because we have no other choice but to hope. There's no other. There's no other hope option. Hope. And what I often, you know, tell my Palestinian audiences is that. You know, the best defenders of Palestinian human rights I know of are Jews. And and I'm seeing more and more of them every year in every conflict. I'm seeing more Jews coming out and saying, uh, not in our name, um, you know, what's being done here is does not agree with our values. And uh, and I think once enough Jews are in that spot that says, th- you know, this the status quo cannot go on. We have to we have to do better. And and enough Palestinians who say, um, you know, we we need to you know we need to find a way to live together in in one place with equal rights. And again, there's more and more of those every year. I think that's where the hope lies uh, in seeing more people who are values driven rather than tribally driven. Um, absolutely. I'm, I'm going to add two things. Part of my hope comes from um, hearing things that you don't hear in mainstream media. Um, I'll give you an example. Um, There's been lots talked about, you know, resistance at, um, excuse me, university campuses. So one particular very large campus that's been in the news a lot, um, uh, um, um, I I can say what it is. It was Columbia University in New York. And there was, you know, there's been a lot said about, you know, anti-Semitism. And um, there was a large protest recently where two conflicting groups were protesting across lawns from each other. And a single protester started shouting anti-Semitic slurs at the pro-Israel group. What you did not hear in the news is that it was the Palestinian protesters who shouted him down and insisted that he stop because that did not represent their values. These are the things that give me hope. Um, The other thing I want to say, because we are talking to an American, North American audience, is, you know, particularly I would say to people who apply to some form of spiritual practice, we are obligated to use our voice. That, for example, insisting on a ceasefire should not be viewed as a political statement, but as a moral judgment, as an insistence on values that killing never resolves anything. And even to go a little deeper to recognize that our Western soul has committed to violence in the name of defense. And that we do have to reckon 
with the ideas that have been built into our Western social fabric that certain kinds of violence, when we deem the perpetrator as enough unlike us, are therefore acceptable. And they are not. You know, as Martin Luther King tried to help us understand that when you commit to violence, you relieve yourself of your soul and moral duty. I do encourage everyone on this call in whatever way works for you to stand with peacemaking, righteousness, and that includes understanding that the violence in Israel-Palestine did not begin on October 7th, and it will not end at the end of this war. It will end when all people in the land have freedom and equal rights to live in peace together. So we're getting towards the top of the hour. So um, I was hoping that you could uh, each read one more passage. And uh, we just put in the chat again where to get the book. Uh, we still have some copies, I believe, as well in FOR's uh, bookstore, online bookstore. And um, yeah, I was, I was hoping you could you could read an an additional. Um... Um, um, yeah, yeah. Some retailers, apparently, many retailers have run out of copies. As being the book is being reprinted now, we've got some copies left, and you can find them at our website, thewallbetween.org. Jeff, shall we read from anti-Semitism? You know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna do outside the box if you're good, Raja. I think we should read a paragraph or two from uh, Values Forward Thinking on page 116. Okay, why don't you get us started? Okay. Perhaps what is most challenging in how we talk about Israel-Palestine here in the West is that we seem unable or unwilling to apply Western norms of human rights and dignity similarly for all of the people involved in the struggle over there. Values forward thinking is in theory a Western exceptionalist ideal. The United States in particular often uses its considerable clout to compel other nations to live up to the basic principles of universal rights and legal protections for all. This morally superior position, however, has rarely been used to push the Israeli government to treat Palestinians according to these same basic universal rights. Would you continue the next paragraph, Raja? Sure. We have looked extensively at the causes for this phenomenon, including Jewish trauma, Western guilt, and geopolitical interests in the Middle East. But this is where we have been, not where we need to be. Among many definitions of justice in the Merriam-Webster di Dictionary, the word is defined as the, quote, establishment or determination of rights according to the rules of law or equity, and the principle or ideal of just dealing or right action, conformity to this principle or ideal, righteousness. The two drivers in this definition are the law and ethical principles, the backbones of both jurisprudence and Judeo-Christian ethics and moral theology in Western societies. And when the term Judeo-Christian traditionally refers to the shared values of Jews and Christians that govern Western thinking, it can also be a divisive term used to separate real Americans from immigrants who are who may adhere to other religious and or cultural traditions. Thank you. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, end us there and uh, just let folks know that Fellowship of Reconciliation, this is really, once I started reading this book, you know, this is the heart of uh, FOR's history and, and the work that we're trying to do. So, um, I aim for us, Raja and Jeffrey, to continue working together on this deep reconciliation. 
And may we get a ceasefire. Thanks for having us here, uh, Ariel, and, and maybe we will meet again in a few months and see where we stand. Yes. Thank you. Thank you all for your participation.